Good afternoon, Sumo, and all you Sumos out there. I'm glad to be coming to you today here at Illuminate 22 to talk about observability driven by design. This is a topic that's near and dear to my heart. And before we get started, I really want to leave you with a couple of questions I want you to think about as you go through this se uh, session today. One is, are your developers happy? What's the relationship that your developers have with your production environment? And uh, as we get into this, I want you to really kind of backtrack and think about these, these questions as we, as we work through this content because I think it's going to be uh, apparent to you as we get towards the end of this uh, track uh, that developer productivity, happiness, and, and, and really comes down to their relationship with production and the data that they have to be able to do their jobs day in and day out. My name is Colin Falwell. I'm an industry veteran. I've been in the industry for a very long time. I started in the 90s. Um, uh, really uh, uh, focused on modern observability and infrastructure back in the days. Uh, but uh, now my, my focus and really for the last 20 years has really been on digital transformation, leading value stream management, DevSecOps, and really focused on modern observability and what it means to build observable systems. Today's topic is on modern observability driven design. We're going to talk about the history of IT, where we're going, and we're only going to do that in three slides. We're going to talk about the principles of observability-driven development, capability of process and process engineering, and how that relates to reliability management, SRE functions within the organization, and then some practical steps that you guys can take that will hopefully help you accelerate in your digital transformation initiatives. Intelligence really is, in my opinion, the only value realization indicator that matters in modern software or the software-driven economy. And what do I mean by that? In order to really compete in today's modern, accelerating digital transformations, you've got to have intelligence, intelligence around the data that you collect. You've got to be intelligent about what you collect, how you collect data. Um, and Kevin Kelly uh, is an author that I uh, have read, uh, really enjoy his, his books. He says that intelligence is a, a combinatorial continuum. And he's really dispelling the myth of about this like kind of superhuman AI. And, the, and what, he's, what he's saying is that the reality is, is that, you know, uh, intelligence in data comes from this horizontal scale. You can't vertically scale it. You've got to have all the data in one place. If you've got partitions of data or islands of data, it's not going to work. Your AI is really constrained by its ability to amass and look at and analyze all of this data. And so we're, we're at a place where as technology accelerates and, and as, um, as systems engineering and development accelerates, we're, we're to a place where you know, AI can only do so much. And it's really incumbent upon us to uh, look at how we develop process and how we develop software and how we ship that software and really putting the information in the developer's hands because uh, we're always going to be limited or constrained by what AI can do. Uh, quote unquote out of the box. Now, 32 years ago, the World Wide Web was invented. Um, back then, <laughs> everything was slow. Servers took 15 minutes to boot on a good day. There wasn't a whole lot of data that came out of those systems. Uh, and in 1990, uh, about four years before Netscape, or the, the, uh, the, the founder of the World Wide Web Foundation, W3C director, uh, Tim Berners-Lee, actually developed the first web browser. Can you guess what it was called? Wait for it. It was actually called the World Wide Web. Uh, so where are we going with all of this? Where have we been? We need to think about where we've been to know really where we're going and, and what we think uh, is modern today is in, in terms of observability-driven development. So back in the 90s and early 2000s, developers would do something. It took months to plan, and they would design and develop. It was waterfall. And so they would uh, spend months and months and months developing software, and they would do one big release. That was great and all uh, for the time. Uh, but the problem is, is that ops would go and release it. People would scream. Everybody say, ah! War rooms would be assembled. Everybody would try to figure out what's going on. And everybody, at the end of the day, would blame the network, mainly because the developers had been working on this for months and months and months. And they knew their software was pretty good. Developers would write more log lines. They'd try to iterate. They'd try to figure out what's going on. Everybody's pointing fingers. And eventually, they would fix the problem. Most of the time at that, it really was the network. And they would rinse and repeat, and they would go around and around. That was basically the 90s and 2000s and kind of the early IT ops. 
over the last decade, we've kind of gotten into DevOps. We've gone into Agile. Uh, we monitor everything with fractured tooling, proprietary agents. A developer would do something, ops would release it, still people would scream. And then you were in a situation where you would try to correlate all of this data across all of these different information silos, proprietary tools, fractured uh, data silos, too much data, everything is red. Um, there's little to no consistency in the metadata. It's really hard to manage. You're dealing with Grok rules, you're dealing with all of this import, things change, uh, your import or your data gets broken. It's just a mess. War rooms, be assembled, again, everybody trying to figure out what was going on, and still everybody blamed the network. But more and more, it became a development problem. It became a software problem. Developers would write more log lines. They would iterate through this. A lot of times it would take maybe weeks to get those log lines into production where they could actually figure out what was going on. The network would blame the application, and it, eventually the problem would get fixed. It generally wasn't the network, though. You'd rinse and repeat and keep going. Today, in the modern evolution, or I'd say modern observability, we're at this place of today, tomorrow, and beyond, what I really call ODD, or, or building observable systems. So this is observability-driven development. So what does that look like? In the modern enterprise, for organizations that are really becoming elite performers, DevSecOps, business analysis, it's intelligent, it's continuous. Data is unified, it's immutable, it's real time. There are common libraries, or language for telemetry, control, and unified pipelines that bring all of this data in in that immutable state. A developer can simply annotate for observability and get real-time feedback from production into what's going on. Codebase will report precise and informed uh, or uniform runtime behavior in a consistent way. And you're able to uh, leverage a control plane to automate a lot of the things about evaluating the outputs of what's going on in the software and understand when to validate canaries or scale up or scale down or roll back intelligently. Developers get immediate feedback on feature tag metrics, traces, logs, and all the events that are taking place. Sounds cool, huh? In order to be able to go from where we've been to this kind of, kind of future state of moving through and solving problems quickly, being able to release software 300 times faster. And these are real statistics. People, uh, organizations are getting to the point where we're, we're looking at a, a 300x improvement in, in release time. You say, well, that's not such a big deal if you think about where we've been in terms of the, the last you know, 30 years going from the 90s to today. But really, no, that 300x improvement in terms of releasing software faster has actually happened in the last two to three years. Google came out with this, uh, this idea of, of being able to track developer performance. It, it called Dora. And it, it deals with de the deployment frequency, the mean time to recovery, change failure rate um, of an organization. And in the most recent refresh of that survey, Google actually found that uh, the number of elite performers within Dora have tripled over the last couple of years. Now over 20% of all organizations uh, are considered elite performers. What does that mean? It means that you have a lead time to change less than a day. So you go from an idea or change or something needs to change in production environment, you can do that in less than a day. Your deployment frequency, you're doing that multiple times per day. Mean time to restore is less than an hour. Your change failure rates, the, the number of failures when you do introduce those changes into production are less than 15%. Now that's pretty impressive statistics if you think about it. But Dora is not the whole story, and, and that's what this session is really about. It's to really talk about what are the other things around Dora that are interdependent and have these relationships with, with being able to, to operate at this elite level. And it has to do with process engineering, and it has to do with capability of process. And we're going to talk about some of those things now as it relates to site reliability engineering. So let's share the secret sauce. Let's get to it. So observability-driven development is this idea or this notion of being able to test in production. You want to test what in production? It's a shift left of all the activities that are required for observing security and observability into this earliest stage of development and really incorporating that into the entire software development lifecycle. Obviously, it involves logging, metrics, traces, and events, or MELT. 
we focus on embracing open standards. We want to opt into vendors versus being locked into vendors. For example, we're not going to use proprietary agents to collect data. We're going to use and leverage open source uh, frameworks for collecting telemetry. We're going to own that from the beginning. We're going to put that into the code base so that we have complete control over what we collect and how we collect. We're solving for the you know, complexity and this inherent uh, you know, uncertainty of modern systems this way. And we're really putting emphasis on being able to, to develop and, and curate really high cardinality data, all the way down to the feature level, right? So being able to tag all of your telemetry logs, metrics, traces, and events down to the feature level and understand that from the development laptop all the way through to the production environment. This ensures that the development organization really has all the information that they need at the time that they need it to be able to make decisions on what needs to get fixed and how to fix it. And it's really a focus on this automation of being able to go self-service from de development all the way into production, uh, which means that, if you think about it, this relationship between the developer and production is fundamentally changing through this process of doing observability-driven development. So the objective within ODD is really to focus on being able to validate code directly in production. Why would we do that? Well, that's where the code is valuable. Code does not provide value to your customers in a lower environment. And remember when I said that Google in their survey said that 20% of all organizations now are elite performers. Those elite performers, those organizations that are doing this, they're going straight from development into production with code. They're going feature level testing and production. They're getting real time feedback out of the production environment into the development uh, workflow. And that really changes the innovation potential of the organization, how fast you can accelerate, and how, how fast you can fix things. Because developers, they no longer have to wait 24, 48, 72 hours to get a code change into production so they can get more log data out of their, out of their environment, for example. So observability-driven development is really rooted, and observability in general, is rooted in this idea of control theory. And you can go look it up. If you look it up, you know, modern observability, it's, it's all based in this idea of control theory. Control theory is basically the, you know, understanding the behavior of a dy dynamic system over time, understanding an entity and the state of that entity in relation of now to some point in time in the past. And it focuses on being able to you know, understand the desired output of the system as a reference variable. So being able to take a metric or you know, some kind of a signal that's coming out of that system and say that's a reference variable. And ensuring that there's stability and reliability as a function of feedback. So understanding that the information that's coming out of that system to understand the internal state represents the internal state of the system. So if that metric or that KPI is, is stable, then I know that the, that the service is stable as well. Now capability of processes is something that goes back to actually the uh, era of the industrial automation. So if you go back to uh, the handbook of industrial automation, you'll find capability of process. It's also in Six Sigma. And it's really the, the, this idea of capability of process or CP is, the, is this notion of defining upper and lower bounds or creating a performance corridor for what you're monitoring through this idea of control theory. And it really is the basis for measuring stability or reliability. It's the foundation of you know, modern SRE in terms of SLIs and SLOs, and really is the mechanism for evaluating that reference output over time as a function of st stability or variability. So having low variability, low uh, or, or high stability within capability g gives you a high capability of process, let's say. All of this obviously means that the third, this third pillar of, of, of you know, kind of observability-driven development really focuses on data quality. You've got to have high-quality data in order to be able to you know, implement a good process around control theory and have high capability of process. It's got to be accurate. It's got to be complete. It's got to be timely. It's got to be relevant. Uh, and uh, it, you know, you've got to have high reliability in, in the data itself. So when we talk about uh, how we curate information and how we leverage technology and tools. It really comes down to the process and process engineering for how we accomplish that. So let's dig into a little bit about capability of process and control and ask ourselves, are we in control? In process engineering, to have a strong capability of process, that's our goal. So what is CP? Capability of process, as defined by Six Sigma, 
is a measure of the relationship between the voice of the process and the voice of the customer. Now, obviously, you can put that to anything. It's not just a process within your application and your customer or the voice of the customer in terms of what they say is you know, good in terms of performance and reliability. This can be applied to any process, the process of shipping software, building software, the process of testing software, the process of going through the design process of building software. Anything that's got process around it represents a capable process or a non-capable process. And the definition of that by virtue is the, that relationship between what you have in terms of the process itself and the voice of the customer, which is the consumer or the user of that process. It's a ratio of the customer requirement or that specification and the expected process or the variation. So to have a low variation means that uh, if you're an assembly line, for example, and you're making cars, low variation and process variation means that I can forecast you know, how many units are gonna come off that assembly, uh, assembly line uh, defective or malformed. In software, to have a high process capability and low variation means that I can predict with relative accuracy how many times am I going to release software and it's going to fail. So we can obviously represent this as a formula. CP then is the specification width by process over process width or if you're thinking about SRE, it's that upper and uh, minus lower specification limit, and it's the sigma or the delta in that. And obviously, because we're talking about six sigma, we're talking about uh, statistical analysis of this, just like the LHC in terms of how they, they look for new particles. They want to reach a statistically relevant signal out of the sampling size of the data. Guess what? When we get to observability-driven development, that's why organizations are moving to production, because the data quality in production is much higher. You're in the actual production environment. You're not having to rely on test data. You're not having to rely on test systems. You're not having to rely on uh, a lot of variables that don't exist in production that might be changing all around you in the lower environment. So it's much easier to get that strong statistical signal out of the production environment with that new code that you're trying to ship. So capability of process in action kind of looks like this. It's a prediction of how well your process is going to meet your customer expectations in the future. A capable process is going to be one where you've got all of these measurements of the feature and they're going to fall within the specification width, which means that I can start to predict what my process is going to look like. It could be an application, it could be a service, it could be an API call. It could be how I ship software through. I can look at and apply this really to anything. But on a typical basis, and especially from an SRE standpoint, we're talking about you know, commonly used inputs like the golden signals being the inputs for these, these types of uh, these process uh, measurements. A customer of mine recently that I was talking to, and, and they took this approach of, of really setting kind of a standard a statement through the organization. Um, and th the statement was really basically like this. For every component and service that we built, what we measure, how we measure it, and why we measure it is going to be published and maintained as an artifact in their repositories, in their pipelines, along with their services for all new things that they write, all new services, all new features, and they're going to retroactively apply that to any existing services as they need to to maintain and require a high capability of process. Now that one statement alone seems pretty simple, but there's a whole lot underneath that. For example, for them to go through this process and do this, they had to completely re-engineer how they build their pipelines to production. They had to provide developers the self-service capability to be able to say, Here's how we're going to describe what normal looks like. Here's what performance looks like of this service. We're going to specify our service level indicators and our service level objectives as code, as part of the config branch that goes along with the actual application code, so that when we ship it to production, all of the information that's needed in order to be able to monitor that and observe that in production is shipped along with the service. It took them, just that one statement, about a year to actually re 
invent themselves in terms of how they ship software, and it goes deeper than that. So within reliability management, when we talk about capability of process, we become in control when we start to merge this idea, this concept, this framework with reliability management. Within reliability management, capability of process shows up in the SLIs and SLOs. It's a foundational principle of, of, of building SLIs and SLOs. It relies on the idea that you're going to have high quality data and that you're going to be able to correlate strong signals within Six Sigma in that statistical analysis. You can think about that kind of like in standard deviation. Six Sigma, you're going to be in that middle layer. You're going to be at three, and you've got three Sigma either direction that you can go. So that's kind of your performance corridor. So if I specify upper and lower specification limits, let's say on response time, I'm going to say that this API call is going to always respond within 500 milliseconds. So I should look at standard deviations above and below that, and I should have a very consistent performance corridor, and I should be able to see that consistency apply across all different levels of scale. So as I scale that service up, as it gets more congested, as the back-end dependencies for that service become more congested or uh, you know, more saturated, even at the network level or within the stack, anywhere in the stack, I should be able to predict and kind of see what that's going to look like. So obviously doing this well really necessitates, you've got to have like, you know, good hygiene in terms of your process. So you can take that idea of high capability process and you can apply that to anything that you find in the organization that isn't matching up what, with what you need in terms of being able to achieve that high capability of process, let's say in the value stream of the organization around what you're doing in terms of delivering value to your customers. Uh, or your revenue streams back into the organization. So, you got to ask yourself, today, are you writing code that really supports capability or, or process capability, having high capability of process? Does your code exhibit deterministic behavior? So for example, deterministic response times on endpoints are going to be predictive within that specification limit for any given load and scale. Well, how do you know that? Well, you have to break it. You have to take it to the breaking point. So are you breaking your software over and over and over? And are you not just doing it once, but you're breaking that API or that endpoint or that code? Maybe you're using mocks uh, to represent your downstream services, for example. Um, and so you've got a service that you've written. You've got downstream dependencies. Rather than testing against those downstream dependencies in a test environment, you could do it on your laptop with a mock that represents your downstream dependencies that you can use to model slow performance or various different failure states of your downstream services. And the goal here is to ramp up and break your service to the point where it, it doesn't scale anymore. And then what does that look like if you scale it out and you were to run two in a cluster? Uh, there's a lot of testing that you can do in an environment that is not at all representative of production before you get there to really help you get an idea of what it looks like. Do I see a hockey stick? In other words, is my response time fairly consistent across as scale increases and then it hockey sticks up when everything falls over? Breaking your applications, breaking your software consistently over and over and over every time you do that is like, uh, you know, the LHC smashing together two protons and looking at all the particles that come out of that over and over and over again. So this idea of, of taking your, your environment and your, your world, maybe I've seen customers do this, they took all of their lower staging environments and they used all that for pipelines to just run automated tests. And so every time there's a pull request that comes uh, in from a developer, that pull request or that merge request goes in, it goes into the pipeline, it does all the acceptance testing, for example. But then after that, it goes in and it starts running these battery of tests where they just ramp up and break, ramp up and break, ramp up and break. And every one of those that test instances becomes a data set that you can correlate. Now you do that enough times, all of the variation in the environment of storage and utilization and uh, overhead or, you know, or systems that are not reliable, that are downstream, that maybe you're depending on, those all fall away. And what you're left with is a high statistical correlation of data. You're looking at uh, a, a signal that is standing out amongst all of this variability or variation. That's what we're after. So what keeps us from getting there? 
Well, for one, lazy coding, bad coding, is probably the number one reason why you write code or you have code that's in production that does not exhibit deterministic behavior. Take, for example, a get all function. So working with a customer recently, they wrote this new web front end, really slick, really awesome, but they had terrible performance problems. They had customers that were calling all the time. And there was a reporting function in the front end of, of this uh, UI. And that reporting function, basically what the developer had done, because the developer couldn't really sit there and predict all of the, the variations that they would need in terms of what they would might want to pull out of the report, they just basically kind of created a get all API call. So the user, the front end user, could really make any kind of report request that they wanted. Um, and depending on how much data they were accessing in the back end, sometimes those calls would come back in two seconds, three seconds. Sometimes those calls would come back 20 to 30 to 40 seconds. If you have a situation like that, if you're an SRE and you're trying to really understand performance as it relates to the customer experience or that voice of the customer and the voice of the process, trying to be able to have an environment where you have low variability. You've got an endpoint, you've got an API call that does not exhibit low variability. It's all over the place. You've got peaks and valleys, there's no consistency, and there's really no way to tell, is that slow transaction a, a good transaction? Or is the fast transaction a bad transaction? Like, you just don't know. Not observing at the right level is another good example of, of what keeps us from getting to this point of de deterministic behavior. For example, uh, payload derived pathing. So you have a model view controller within, let's say, your Java stack. Based on the content or the payload that's coming in with that request, um, it may go down one path, it may go down another path in code. Those different paths are going to exhibit different variations. They're going to have different performance characteristics. So we're, we're now dealing with a situation where I can't just look at the headers. I can't look at what's on the, the request uh, I can't look at the method invocations. I can't, I can't really get into understanding the behavior of my application just based on the surface information or the surface details that might be available to me, say through tracing or uh, through logging. Uh, it, it is available through logging, but it's incumbent now upon the developer to be able to tag or use structured logging or to do something in the log that says, hey, this request was for this apple or that orange or this function or that function. Uh, of the back end and, and being able to kind of uh, atomize that out or break it out and understand things that way. Not being able to bucket calls like for like really down to that lowest common denominator. Aside from bad coding, this is really what it comes down to. And being able to understand that deterministic behavior, you really need to be able to build histograms of like for like things. So, you know, all the calls of type A going into one bucket, all the calls of type B going into another. So for example, our performance metrics or our, our, uh, our metrics, we've got this idea of service latency if you're, if you're doing tracing. We've got service latency metrics. We've also got service operation latency metrics. What's the difference? Well, the service latency is going to bundle everything up, all of the different operations of an endpoint, of a service. It's gonna roll all that up and basically average it all for you. Well, that's great, but if you see variation in service latency, really what you're looking at is you're looking at variations in the types of calls. Let's say that you've got 12 different calls that happen on that service. You're just looking at variations going across all those different calls. It's just a shift in production utilization and load and, and traffic. It's not necessarily that things are speeding up or slowing down. So response time, if you're really trying to understand low variability and are things healthy, doing it at the service level is not a very good way of doing it. Errors, that's a different story. Looking at your kind of your aggregation of, of errors and those sorts of things, that's good. But in terms of response time, not good. But let's look at service operation latency. If we go to service operation latency, now what we're doing is we're looking at each discrete operation that that service, all those 12 operations, we're looking at those individually. So we're bucketing all of the call types, the you know, get something versus you know, something else. We're looking at all of those together and, or individually, and, and we're able to compare much more accurately what that response time looks like. Now, if we still have response time that's not deterministic or not, not consistent, it may be that because we're still not at the right level. Is service operation latency enough? No. Because now, underneath that service operation, you have all the method invocations. So you have your HTTP calls like 
post, get, put, delete. You need to be able to look at that level. And potentially there are other variables, things that you're going to find that are in the cookies or in the headers or in the response or in the request calls that are going to further define that. And it really is protocol specific. It's, 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 uh, it's dependent on uh, a lot of variables, including things like um, what kind of frameworks are you using? What's your code base? It really pays to sit down if you're an SRE and focus and spend some time with your development organization around all the, the different uh, characteristics or exhibits in terms of what makes response time tick within an application and service. And you really kind of do that at a, at a, at a, at a kind of a component level. You kind of have to work your way through the end-to-end -end architecture and really understand what's going on. One of the ways to do that, and I've seen organizations very successful in this, is to have a real quiet environment. Run your entire environment with no transactions and make one call, one execution of every function in your site or in your code, in your application. When you do this, you have a kind of a reference playbook or a reference architecture of, of every code path, every variable, everything that you want to be able to track. That's a good place to start because from that point, you can really just start breaking down and saying, okay, are there other request types? Are there other things that are happening on those API calls that might differentiate what my performance is going to be in production that I need to take into consideration so that I can have that deterministic response times that I'm looking for? So what else can you use? Those are the things that I want you to take away from this and go back and think about as you start putting together your strategy for how you log, uh, how you look at metrics, how you look at uh, uh, logs, transaction traces, and various events that are taking place within your production environments. Now let's transition from that whole kind of idea and this concept of, of building deterministic response times and now let's apply this to the service level methodology. If you look at Google, we talk about service level indicators, objectives, and looking in error budgets. The first thing that we'll see in the service level methodology within SLIs is this carefully defined quantitative measure of some aspect, right, of this level of service that is provided, which means that, again, we're focusing on the emphasis, the emphasis here being high quality data, really looking at this information, using the golden signals, for example. Uh, having this deliberate focus on measuring the smallest possible number of things. We don't want to do this to everything. We want to get down to like one or two KPIs, if we can, that really represent the internal state of the system from a service level indicator. This really embodies the voice of the customer or should embody the voice of the customer. What we choose in terms of this deliberate focus needs to really translate to, hey, if this is consistent and stable, my customer experience is good. The service level methodology from an objective standpoint is the idea that we're going to take this target value of ranges. Remember we talked about the upper and lower specification limits that is measured by an indicator. And we're going to you know, think about this in terms of how much time minus 100% is that SLI going to hold over a period of time. And so your service response, let's say, is going to be faster than 400 milliseconds for 95% of all your requests. Now we're taking this idea within the service level objective and we're taking it to the law of nines. We're going to measure this over some, some period of time. And as long as we're within that, that corridor, that type performance, we're good. And let's take that one step further to this idea of error budgets. We're going to go 100% minus the SLO over its time frame. How long is it in that threshold? How long is it out of that threshold? The easiest way to think of this is like the number of minutes per month over the last number of days, which it's okay for the goal not to be reached. So my error budget might be 99.8%. It might be 95%. It really depends. This is going to be something that's really specific to each individual service, uh, each individual component. And, you know, it's the law of nines. Um, don't make something 99.99999% uh, uh, available from an error budget perspective if it doesn't need to be. Sometimes, uh, you know, every time you want to add another nine, you're going to exponentially spend more and more uh, to get it into that state. So the law of nines here is really, really important in terms of thinking about, you know, how we uh, focus on error budgets and service level objectives and indicators. We just don't want to go overboard on this. And it really pays to really sit down as a team and think about what is it that we need to accomplish. So in all, right, the service level methodology is this idea of being able to have a budget of acceptable level of unreliability. 
and then to, to have a target for those SLIs within an objective and that service level indicator being that quantitative measure of service reliability and doing it down to the, the least number of variables that you can that have the, the exhibit the most stability in terms of your environment and you're going to measure to those things. And when you do that, you're going to find that you have highly capable process. And when things deviate in trend because you're introducing all that change into the environment and that change is actually accelerating that 300x, you've got elite performers that are releasing multiple times per day, so your environments are undergoing extreme amount of change compared to what they used to. And when that happens and you see these things shift, now you've got that ability going back to this idea of, of you know, kind of the modern DevSecOps or you know, kind of where we are today and tomorrow. It's all about automation. It's about having control planes that are tied into understanding what these variables are and to be able to look at those things and say, oh, there's a deviation. I'm going to go ahead and pop that out. I'm going to roll that back and I'm going to, you know, change my canary deployment strategy. I'm going to provide that feedback to the developer. So the developer's not around, you know, sitting there waiting for something to happen for days, waiting to, to hear if, you know, there's a, a complaint. The developer can put that new feature in to the production environment directly. They can test it. They can analyze it. They get that feedback right away. And if things are good, it can go ahead and release and stay in production. Otherwise, it'll roll back out and they can continue to work on their project. So the next steps, and we're just going to wrap up, kind of going like all of these ideas and concepts. How can you go and take this into uh, and put it into practice? One of the things that I've, I've seen organizations do is, you know, this idea of going around this, uh, you know, building these, you know, kind of new uh, statements about, you know, this is how we're going to ship uh, software. Um, you know, your developers understand the software the best. They should be the ones that really know how the system should operate. They should be the ones that declare reliability. Here at Sumo Logic, one of the cool things that we're doing now is this reliability by objective is this idea of being able to take open SLI, open SLO, uh, it's an open source project, and you, you can actually declare all of this as code with your project. You can articulate what is normal. You can articulate your reliability, your law of nines. You can tie that to release gates to drive autonomous deploys, tie that into the control plane, also tie that in and auto automatically build dashboards and, and, and monitors, for example. And all around that, that really unlocks this culture where every engineer cares about their application status. They uh, care about and seek the needs of the business stakeholders. Every engineer is focused on doing on-call rotations. There's no more application engineers that just write code. Um, this culture shift around, you know, having a dedicated team to provide developer self-service or these self-service capabilities, it's basically access to production with guardrails. There's got to be this, from a security perspective, this natural separation of, of responsibility and duty. Developers should not have access to production data, but they should have access to the information uh, about the performance of their application code in production, and that should be continuous and uh, coming to them at all times. And this emphasis of really you know, building observability into every tool chain, thinking about what does it mean to build observable systems. Reliability management is one of those things. Sumo makes it very easy to bring in all of this rich contextual information around not just DevOps and operations, but security as well. One platform, full text search, advanced query languages. It gives you this ability to bring in all the information that you need. It's unified, it's immutable, and it really makes the difference in terms of being able to drive these cultural changes within the organization. From a process perspective, code's only valuable in production. So go start testing in production. Find the opportunities and figure out what's in the way from giving your developers that ability to go straight into production with code. If you want to be an elite performer and you're not, that is the goal that you're after. So canary releasing, ring deployments, doing multi-region, chaos engineering, shadow testing, all of these concepts, really, if you, if you put the focus on that's where you want to go with process, you're going to find that you start doing observability-driven development and you start driving high capability of process. From a best practices standpoint, build a charter. Develop a, a maturity model roadmap. Start doing performance analysis early in the development life cycle. Uh, create a you know, template within JIRA, for example, for tracking specific things to performance. Uh, decompose your apps, we talked about this. You know, really understand your application performance and, and threshold. Look at what does it look like in the best of, of cases and, and in the worst of cases when things break. Um, involve your architects, conduct architectural reviews, really get into this, this uh, you know, understanding what it is that you're running in production. 
focus on what you need the answers to. What happened? When did it happen? What feature was requested? How long did it take? These types of questions, if you think about when you're developing software, if you understand what it is that you need out of that, you can really build your observability program to, to, to design these observable systems. Logging. Consider going to structured logging. Even if you're not doing structured logging, um, it really uh, simplifies your, your querying and consistent metadata. Make that consistent across the organization in terms of how you structure logs. Employee strategies are going to really focus on minimizing code complexity for observability. For example, you don't want a bunch of clutter in your code because we're moving to open source frameworks like OpenTelemetry. Think about how you put that framework into your code so that it's structured, it's clean, it's nice, whether it's domain or aspect-oriented programming. Focus on your business logic and execution context. So what does it mean to the business? What does the business need out to understand the health of those revenue streams, the, the value stream to the organization. In retrofit scenarios, if you're going backwards in time and you've got monolithic environments, focus on where you've got hotspots of a lot of code change taking place in those more legacy systems. If you're not full on doing app modernization yet, there's still an opportunity to put open telemetry into those and consistently tie those things together. Things that aren't changing, that probably not necessary that you have the, the full stack observability solution around those things. Logging's probably enough or logging and metrics. But put your tracing where you're doing that active development. It's really going to simplify things when you do have problems. So standardize that output. Have the same context everywhere. Make it consistent. Build internal packages that you can deploy across all of your development teams. For example, open telemetry, you can take that SDK and you can standardize it to your liking and then you can make that something that all of your development organizations consume. On the metrics side, metrics really should relate to capability of process. Your business metrics should really be a dimension of reliability. Making sure that you're aligning that common metadata. Again, making sure that you have high cardinality. Everything is there. You've got low variability. Uh, you classify those metrics as leading or lagging indicators. You should be able to describe any metric that you're tracking as a lower and upper specification limit for SLIs or SLOs, and that all should relate to the relationship of the business as it, as it relates to the golden signals. From a trace perspective, auto instrumentation frameworks will save you a lot of time, but they're not going to do everything for you. You really need to standardize that custom attributes and custom metadata, putting session attributes and things that are really irrelevant to the business into place. Ensure that you can match those traces uh, to logs and metrics using the, the automated capabilities that you get out of OpenTelemetry. Trace your users that are using the features, do those feature tags, capture different business logic routines, really understand the flow of your application and what are the various different attributes that, that uh, differentiate one transaction from another. Make sure you got that high consistent cardinality across all of your data. It's going to make it easy for you to have a high capability of process in your organization. And it's going to really drive you to that elite performance. So just from an from a opposite end of things, let's look at things from kind of an anti-pattern perspective. This is a really good way to measure yourself. If you have a lot of haystacks of data, if you're vendor sourced or you've got disjointed collection. So if you've got many glasses of paint versus a single pane of glass, or you really lack a unified analytics control plane for the self-service automation, you're not setting yourself up. This is not observability-driven development. If you've got vendors supplied, uh, agentry, proprietary agents, all of those vendor agents have a lot of technical debt that come with them. You're putting that into your production environment. Start taking control of your data. Start taking control of what you're doing and how you curate that information. Bring that into the open source frameworks. Standardize that across your organization and you're really going to be set up really well. I'm going to leave you with this last slide. Ron Lieberman, a production engineer over at Facebook, said this. It says, as a developer, I'm not, if I'm not getting feedback on the code that I'm pushing and the changes that I'm making, I'm going to get burned out immediately. This really comes down to that satisfaction level with your developers, right? He's probably going to get burned out and leave the company. But it's not really a problem with the company. It's, it's the relationship between the developer and production. So I'm going to take us back to that very beginning of the, of the session where I asked you, are your developers happy? What's their relationship with the production environment? Use this as an opportunity to enforce some change in your organization, 
focus on process engineering, focus on what you can do with the open source frameworks. Again, it's not just about the technology, it's about people, it's about their relationship to the data in production. I really hope you've enjoyed this slide. My name is Colin Falwell, field CTO here at Sumo Logic. If you would like to reach out to me, connect uh, on LinkedIn. I'm happy to have further conversations or come in and help your organization with uh, some of the things that you could do to help further your uh, journey through digital transformation and becoming an elite performer. Thank you.